Good to go. All right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kent Anderson. I'm the CEO of Redlink, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to a session we're calling the 100% Solution, Using Data to Make Better Decisions. Data is all around us. Our publishing platforms, technology solutions are throwing off data all of the time. We have data coming at us from third-party providers, making sense of it, and making it matter to our businesses is now a new challenge and one that various stakeholders have different perspectives on. So we have a number of stakeholders here today. Um, it's my pleasure to moderate this. I run a data platform company, and so we're dealing with usage data and other data sources all the time. We have the pleasure of interacting with a lot of you as far as understanding how data applies to your business, how to interpret it. You give us feedback as to how you want to see it. And so I think that because we live on both, on all sides of the market with end users, libraries, and publishers, we have a lot of input. I'll try to bring that to bear to the discussions that we have today. And I think that the panelists today will give you some really great insights. So I'm pleased to introduce the panelists. Uh, we have an editor, a salesperson, a librarian, and a business analyst to speak with you. So. Uh, Left, right, right, left, we have Howard Bachner, the Editor-in-Chief of JAMA and the JAMA Network. On my far right, Bob Purcell, Vice President of Sales at Dragonfly Sales and Marketing. On my immediate right, Amira Aron, Interim Dean of Libraries and Associate Dean of Scholarly Resources at Northeastern University, where my daughter goes. Go Huskies. <laughs> and on my immediate left, Mary Silge, Business Analyst at Canadian Science Publishing uh, a publisher in probably the prettiest city I've ever been to, except for Edinburgh, Scotland, Ottawa, Canada. So is that where you live? Good choice. And sorry about the senators, but <laughs> they went deep, so that's good. So we're going to talk about um, selling to institutions, about data-driven collections in libraries, about using data to make decisions, and then ultimately kind of bring in a holistic view of that, especially from the publishing perspective. Pardon the swear word, but metrics are all around us. And how many of you subscribe, how many of you follow this one anyhow? Okay, so you see the swear word all the time. So we live in a, a era of rankings. Um, so this, this quick survey was rankings are evil, rankings are evil, rankings are evil. We did this well, this, we did well this year, so, and of course, guess which one won. So we only like rankings and we only like data when they agree with kind of our predisposition about how we think the world works. That's one of the big challenges of data interpretation, is that people tend to bring up a, a presupposition to it. And one of the nicest things I ever see in my role is when we have data that makes people think differently. And they look at it and they go, oh, I didn't know that. Now, that said, there are a lot of measures, and you'll hear a lot of different measures today during this session. In the case of the stock market, there are now more ways to index and measure the stock market than there are stocks. So let that sink in. So even picking what you choose to measure is an important framing principle about how you interpret data, because availability errors and things like that always enter into the picture. So my goal as the facilitator is to help identify what I'll call crosstalk. That's when people are either talking against each other or to each other and trying to draw lines about why that's happening. To challenge these wonderful speakers, and they are really top of the line, no pressure. Uh, to find points of intersection and shared utility. So as you hear one another talk, please kind of make notes um, about what you're hearing and how it bears on what you might do, maybe, you, maybe makes you think differently. To focus on addressable data rather than just decorative data or data that I like to see but I don't really use. And then again, to try to get people to talk about how they interpret that, how it gets used <coughs> internally, how it gets used to make decisions. So with that said, I'm going to start with Dr. Bachner. And we will kick off there. Sir, there's the advancer if you want to use oh, it. Oh, great. And Thank you. Pointer. Great. Thank you. So um, I am going to talk about 
uh, how we've used data at JAMA to make decisions. But I, I would say two things. The, the benefit of having so much data is I can always find data to justify whatever decision I want to make. So that's the really good news. And then the other thing is the two major decisions we made shortly after I arrived were not based upon data. So um, th it's the juxtaposition between <coughs> quantitative data and the power of narrative. Let's see. You can just hit the space bar. Oh, I got it. Okay. So um, very briefly, this is the story of change at JAMA. These are the only the major changes. I would only highlight a few. There are many of uh, the upcoming slides will uh, re-emphasize them. The first was the creation of a brand. And so I think many of you are probably aware that we took the archives journals and in one day renamed all of them. And we called them JAMA Surgery, JAMA Pediatrics. I had a funny conversation with Richard Horton at Lancet, who seemed to be giving birth to a new journal every six months. And Richard said to me, yeah, but you gave birth to nine new journals in one day. Um, and, and so I think it was this notion of uh, creating a brand, and I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, more, more, more recently, in response to what younger people want, we've increased and changed the way we distribute podcasts. I'll show you the numbers a little later on. Uh, that's the 2015, 2016, that's, that's bolded. And um, three years ago, we had 300,000 downloads of our podcasts uh, during the course of the year. This year, we'll have two and a half million downloads of our podcasts. Um, and then just some of the other things was the launching of new journals. Uh, and then in April of 2017, uh, recognizing the changes in the way in which funders would like to see their material published, uh, we uh, launched uh, or announced that across the entire suite of journals, uh, the exception being JAMA, that all of the journals would be hybrid or open access journals. This was a major change that we made. We took art off the cover. There was no data uh, involved in that decision. I got about 100 emails. I responded to every single one of them. None were positive. They were all negative. Um, that's often the world I live in. All of those people are the vast majority self-identified, and they self-identified as being about 70 or 75 years of age. Um, for me, that only re-emphasized that it was the right decision. They weren't really the future of the journal. I uh, appreciate that JAMA was always identified as having fine art on the cover. But on the other hand, I think modern times had really changed. JAMA has one of the largest print circulations in the world, 310 to 320,000. And so being able to see our content very quickly in a modern world was very, very important. Um, I did call a Dr. Smith from the Midwest because he hand wrote me a long note about uh, the pain in taking art off the cover. And I called his office, and his office manager said, well, he doesn't speak to representatives from drug companies on the telephone. You're going to have to come in. So I did tell her I actually wasn't a representative from a drug company. I was a journal editor. Dr. Smith was about 73. He picks up the phone, and he said, god damn it, I didn't think you'd actually call me. <laughs> so, and then one other uh, brief vignette, um, someone wrote a long note and said he had no idea how medical students and residents were going to learn about fine art in the world with it coming off the cover of JAMA. So I did write back. I said I didn't think it was one of the core competencies to learn about fine art via the journal. Um, and we did have some qualitative data. We had some quantitative data about downloads and views that very few people actually knew that the nine archives journals had anything to do with JAMA. So you have one of the great brands in the world, like Mercedes or Lexus, and you weren't utilizing it in any meaningful way. And you know, and if you look back on it now, can you uh, imagine launching, launching two new journals in 2013, 14, or 15 and calling them Archives of Oncology or Archives of Cardiology? So people would come to my office and they would say, these archives titles, are they old JAMAs that you've somehow done something with? So that's in part why we, we renamed uh, all of the journals. A and um, as you can see, we, we did it in 2013-14. Uh, um, and then Oncology was launched in 15 and 16. And as, uh, I'll show you the views a little later on across the network. But you know, one measure that people you know, do follow quite closely is impact factor. 
the average increase in, of impact factor for the journals last year, which was the first full year uh, of the new titles, uh, averaged 35 percent across the nine journals. And, and, and so for us, um, uh, that's one, just one important marker of the importance of uh, using uh, uh, the brand in a different way. Reading habits have changed, busier lives. And uh, editors can make a mistake when they're judgmental about that. Uh, and I, I think oftentimes editors may say to themselves, you know, people really should read the long version of the article. Well, that may be something that I believe, but uh, as I said, younger people and even older people have busier lives and they want content in a more digestible fashion. And so we've uh, introduced a series of new article types. Uh, JAMA Infographics is on the upper right. They average about 15 or 20,000 views each time. Uh, JAMA Performance Improvement, JAMA Clinical Guidelines Synopsis, these are all two-page article types. The JAMA Clinical Guidelines Synopsis of the Sepsis Guideline, that's re re released from the two critical care uh, societies, one in the U.S., one in, in Europe. The full guideline on their journal websites has 50,000 views. I just looked this morning. The, the views of our two-page synopsis of that guideline has 280,000 views. The editorial on it has 67,000 views. And, and so I, I, I think uh, when you introduce new article types and then you measure how they do, you know if you're being successful or, or not being successful if you think having the material read is important. And as an editor, I actually think having the material read is a very good thing. Um, and these are just some uh, other examples. We we've take some content from the medical letter. It's the uh, only thing, along with the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, that passes through into JAMA uh, without uh, peer review. Uh, and then JAMA Guide to Stats and Methods, uh, your upper left. I wanted to uh, announce it in social media that JAMA does S&M, but my attorney uh, persuaded me <laughs> that that probably was not the best approach. Um, but again, you know, other journals have done it. I, I think oftentimes we have more resources and can really do it in, in a way that's uh, more effective. So these are always tied to an article that's within the journal, and so people can read the article. And if it has a very sophisticated type of stats or methods, people can go, go on and read some accompanying material. And I, uh, Steve Morrissey is here, and we're good colleagues, and I uh, mentioned that we just introduce two new article types, or one new article type. They're kind of brief updates, uh, 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 treatment of hypertension 2017, treatment of type 2 diabetes 2017. They're two pages, always, always accompanied by a figure or a table, because figures and tables are critically important in social media. We have very, very good data that when we push content out in social media, if it's accompanied by a figure or a table, the uptake will be far greater. And uh, Aram's paper has about 400,000 views. Joanne Manson's is just short of 500,000 views. The weekend that Mike Berkowitz pushed it out on social media, and we're very careful when we push content out, generally more on weekends, usually early in the morning. We have a lot of data about when you push content out, the uptake may be greater or less, depending upon uh, what type of material you're pointing out. Over that weekend, the views increased by about 100,000, and Joanne's piece had a million likes on Facebook. And that's in part because of the figure that's embedded in it. So our graphics department works very closely with the authors uh, to, develop, um, uh, to develop graphics if we know that the article is going to move into social media. And this is just our content. And, and I think people inherently know this, uh, but sometimes they, they often forget. Um, if you look at the leading generalist journals, uh, a, a third of our content or less is original research. That's the irony of it. It drives the impact factor, but a third of our original, uh, a third of our author pieces is original content. Two thirds is not original research. It's so-called value-added material. And, and people are always struck uh, when, um, uh, when they hear those data, but they're, they're uh, quite true. If you look at the leading journals, if you look across the JAMA network journals, it's a, about a three to one ratio or two to one ratio in all of the journals. That is that value added materials will be editorials, commentaries, short article types, long reviews, but they will not be original research. And on this, um, uh, on this table you can see 
in response uh, to what we know are changing reading habits, if you look at CRE shorts, uh, when I arrived in 2011, it was 14, 24, 43, and then uh, now they're up to above 100. So two or three, essentially, in each issue. Um, when I arrived, this, uh, when, when I arrived, 5% of contact to JAMA came through a device, okay? Last year, it was 40% at JAMA. It was actually 45% in surgery. Psychiatrists tend to use devices a little less, so psychiatry was only 25 or 30%. So we were faced with a challenge. People aren't using desktops to consume our content. So, so how, as an editor and a publisher, do we respond to that? That was critically important for us to understand. And we were making a decision about a new app or a new website. Investments in new websites cost well into seven figures. And so we had to balance using these data to drive our next, our next decision. This is Pope Benedict um, uh, announcement in 2005. And this is Pope Francis in 2013. The world is fundamentally different in the last decade, fundamentally different. I don't know where it, it will stop. We kind of have an internal pool going on. I think somewhere around 40, 45%. Other people think it could be as high as 50 or 55%. But our old website was not as design responsive as we wanted it to be. And with new technologies, you can create a website that adjusts to whatever device you uh, come to that website on. And so we made a decision shortly after these data were emerging that we were watching to forego the development of new app, a new app and put our resources both intellectual and financial into the development of a new website. And that was a fundamental decision because everyone has limited resources to really make sure that we focused our resources on what we thought reflected the changing landscape in the data we were seeing. Um, and, and so one of the goals was to ensure that it be design responsive. And so it took us about a year, 18 months. Um, uh, it's not a paid advertisement. You know, if Thane Kerner was here, I would tell, uh, tell you our first website with him in 12 or 13 was like kind of a good Toyota, maybe, maybe a Honda. Uh, JAMA, JAMA doesn't try to do average. We really try to be exceptional. That's really, really important to us. And, and now I think we're kind of driving a Mazda Miata, which I love, so I'm really excited. And this is the new website. It's design responsive. It's incredibly fast. Um, I was just in China. It was no struggle at all to get it. It's design responsive. And I think this is the biggest innovation. This is a split screen version of what the HTML looks like. This is how we all read content. You don't read linearly. You read side by side. So when you're reading our content on the HTML version, you see text on one side and you see tables and figures on the other side. And we get constant feedback that this represents a substantial improvement in peop for people who want to read the entire article, which could only be 5 or 10%. I fully recognize that. But this really was clear. We had done a lot of qualitative research. Then we looked at the way we read articles. So when I'm reading an article, I pull apart the pages and I put the tables and figures here so I can read the text and then look at the tables and figures. And we realized we could duplicate that reading experience. We could duplicate that reading experience on our website. In, in addition, what you don't see here is that all of the value-added material is on this site. So multimedia, podcasts, videos, editorial comment is all a click away. And interestingly enough, podcasts that accompany about one in every four or five articles plays on a different website. And there's a, it was a conscious decision to do that because if it plays on a slightly different website, you can listen and scan the rest of the content on the current website, whereas if it played on the identical website, you could not multitask and many, many people multitask. And you have to be very careful about how you load content. I love the New York Times. 
except what they've done with loading videos has made it very, very difficult if you hit the back button now because they're loading so much content, it has actually slowed down their website. So you really have to be careful about the decisions you make about how you load content on websites. Faster, cleaner, design responsive, surfaces multimedia, and a split screen for major papers. Um, just a few other slides. There's not, uh, it, it's not that important to know all of the details, but what we try to do is uh, JAMA publishes every Tuesday, and we put some materials online ahead of print. We've been particularly putting um, uh, opinion pieces, we call them viewpoints, online ahead of print. And we did an analysis late last year to look at the views of uh, viewpoints that went online ahead of print and then were printed versus those that only went into print. And the number of views for the viewpoints that went up about a month before they're in print were twice as high as the views of articles that were only put up on Tuesday. And so now 100% of our viewpoints go up online ahead of print. To me, that, that was really important data to know you could double consumption of your content by putting it up first online and then doing it again uh, with the publication of an issue on each Tuesday. Um, majority of viewpoints now go online first with print to follow. When I sh arrived, I watched us deal with uh, book reviews. Um, our editors are highly neurotic. Uh, we could take a 500 word book review and spend 10 hours copy editing it. It was driving me crazy, okay? And uh, we, we were collecting hundreds of books in, in the office. And then I looked at views and no one was reading the book reviews. So I'm faced with a decision of us putting in hours and hours into book reviews that no one was reading and the books were collecting dust in our library. We don't have book reviews any longer, okay? So that was a decision based upon the numbers, so the intellectual work it was taking and the numbers. That's in contrast to the patient page where I wanted to do away with the patient page, but then we got the numbers. Our patient pages now average about 15,000 views each week. The patient page that we just put up on Alzheimer's has 80,000 views. And, and so for us, we've tried to use views or downloads or sessions to really drive the decision. Um, we used to do a weekly author report video uh, at great expense. And when I first arrived, they had about 8 million views by radio or TV or news. But over the course of five years, those author report videos had declined from about eight or 10 million to two or three million. So we, we would create a video, we'd, we'd send a group out, they'd do a shot, uh, they'd interview the physician, and then that B-roll was released to the media. And uh, over a five-year period, what we found out was that less and less people were acknowledging or showing that that actually came from JAMA. They were chopping up the B-roll into 30-second blurbs. Um, we've taken those resources and created three new technology positions. We don't do weekly videos anymore. It just didn't make sense to produce content in which the numbers were declining and JAMA got no credit. And we needed people to do more podcasts, and so we took those resources and moved them into different types of tech technological changes. These are the numbers over the course of five years. Print has been stable. Short article types have increased from about 900 to 1,400. Um, we publish about 80 or 85 randomized trials each year. Our electronic table of contents now goes out to about 645,000 people. Online first, which is usually late breakers at trials, although the scientific world has changed, a lot of the meetings they used to have late breakers that were only clinical trials. Now they want to have a late breaker session in the morning and the afternoon, five days a week, and the value of those late breakers isn't the same as it was five years ago, but we do about 40 a year. Facebook and Twitter, when I arrived, was at 20,000. Now it's about 625,000. Our views, uh, 10 million to 30 million. The data from 2017, we're, we're four months in. Uh, JAMA will be about 38 million views this year. 
Impact factors done nicely, 30 to 38. And the JAMA network downloads was 19 million when I arrived, 59 million last year, and we're on target to hit 80 million views this year. And, you know, it's hard to get individual users. Publishers made an interesting decision 20 or 30 years ago. I, you all probably know the date better than I. When you said you'd, si you'd sell to libraries, but you'd get no individual information from those libraries. So much of our usage comes from libraries, and we're really blind to it. Um, we've really tried to increase the number of people that we can identify, but most of the use of most journals uh, because of library sales is blind to who the actual user is. But we're, we're pretty comfortable saying between print, social media, electronic table of contents that we, we actively push content out to about one and a half million physicians each week. Use of data, but of course, uh, why collect data if it's not used? And as I said, I have so much data, I can always find data to justify any decision I want to make. Thank you very, very much. We'll save questions for the end. So if you have questions for Howard, please um, jot them down. And now we're going to enter the, the I sell content, I buy content paradigm. I'm going to start with Bob Purcell, who's going to talk about selling content. Okay. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for attending the session. And I wanted to start off by talking about the name of this session, which is called the 100% Solution. And it's uh, a little bit ironic because in sales, we are constantly talking about the pipeline. And of course, we are striving to get to the 100% uh, line, which is to close a sale successfully. And so um, thank you, Ken, for naming the, uh, or whoever named this uh, session, um, the 100% solution. And I named my speech the ABCs of using data, persuasion, and persistence. Um, and I should have used a classic piece of data, either a thesaurus or a dictionary, because you'll notice that the word persuasion and persistence are misspelled here. <laughs> but nevertheless, I persist. So ABC in, in uh, sales, uh, as many of you may be familiar, stands for always be closing. So no matter what stage of the uh, sales cycle that we're in, we as salespeople and sales managers want to get to the next stage so that we can eventually get to the 100% solution. And in each stage of the pipeline um, and each stage of the sale, we are working with data. We are also working with human beings and other factors that um, incorporate data and a bit of skill and persistence and persuasion. So some keys to working with the, um, in the sales process um, to get to that 100% line are identifying the prospect, naturally, and in our world, you are working with the library, uh, a librarian to, to make a sale. And usually, but not always, it's the person who is responsible for data collection and, and then people at the top, um, such as the director or, or a deputy director. And then once you identify that prospect, you are working to build rapport with that uh, person and then uncover their, their needs and then position your product or products, responding to objections, and eventually asking for the sale. And all along the way, you're using your skills as a salesperson and data to, to hopefully make the sale. I found an interesting, um, in, in the course of preparing uh, this presentation, I found an interesting uh, web 
site and person who I was unaware of. Um, but I really like what he has to say and, and conveniently he lives in Washington, D.C., so perhaps I'll get a chance to meet him someday. His name is Dan Pink. I encourage you to go to danpink.com. He has an interesting take on what today's ABC should be, um, starting with attunement, listening to and understanding the other person, seeing through another person's eyes. So again, getting to really know your, the person you're dealing with on the other side of the desk um, or phone or computer. Um, buoyancy, being optimistic, being resilient, um, and especially given the amount of times that people will say no to a solicitation. And we work that into our data calculations in terms of the overall number of prospects that we start out with and as we move them through the funnel to the, to the bottom where we get the number of sales. Um, and clarity. So with all the data out there in the world today, it's, in, it's especially important that we try not to overwhelm people um, because there's, it seems like the more data it, there is, there's also less time. Although last time I checked, there's still 24 hours in a day, but still it, it does seem like there's less time. So um, the best uh, sellers and persuaders tend to be curators, um, people who are able to take all the relevant information and turn it into a short, easy, and compelling story to be able to convey to the person you're speaking to. So now we come to strategy. Um, and with a lot of us, we are selling multiple uh, products, and a lot of times we're trying to sell collections. Um, some of us have single titles, of course, but a lot of us have multiple titles. And really these days, um, it's easier to sell a critical mass of content to libraries, although sometimes you can go overboard, and you know that has its own uh, story in the marketplace these days as we, as we talk about the big deal quite frequently. Um, then uh, another thing to take into account, um, and, and data comes in heavily into play here, um, is appropriate pricing for each territory and consortium that you deal with because um, while we have the world at our fingertips here, there, it's, there are different factors and issues and economies around the world that necessitate that we have different pricing to different territories and different kinds of institutions. Um, and part and parcel of that is working with uh, territory appropriate salespeople. So it's ideally um, uh, um, great to be able to have sales agents who are your boots on the ground, um, who live and work in the territories where you think you have opportunity to sell. Um, and a key part of all of it is uh, if you are working with several different reps to stay on top and really channel management. You can't just let your sales agents um, operate without any guidance and information and data. So the plan of action then. Um, in our uh, world, typically we follow the academic sales season. So the sales seasons that we operate on are typically anywhere from January to June. And then, you know, there's not many months off really and it's maybe the slower months are perhaps June and July, but we start getting uh, working again in August all the way through the end of the year. So um, the spring and the fall have a, have a big uh, uh, connotation or number of months in, in the sales world. Um, there are um, our team at Dragonfly, we work with both uh, direct reps, uh, people who work for us, and agencies, and that's typically the mix that you're going to find in scholarly publishing. Um, each year, we work with our clients, so whether you're a publisher or you're, you're um, an independent agency, to set a 
goal um, and what we call a target or a stretch goal. Uh, but we work from a baseline, which is our budget, but that's the minimum we want to do. What we really want to do is reach a realistic goal and then have a stretch goal. Now the pipeline, that's the, the, key, the key element here. And the pipeline that we work with has four levels. Um, and what we do at the start of the year is to create a pipeline where we think we can generate the baseline budget number, the goal number, and the target number. So we're going to have a lot more prospects um, who we classify at 10%. Uh, that means we have a 10% chance of selling to all of the prospects. Um, then we have at the end of the day where we close successfully. Um, so we might have, as an example, a thousand prospects uh, that we start off with. And then as we move them through the pipeline, a qualified prospect means that they are interested and they get classified at 20%. Um, then when we negotiate with them, it's about anywhere, we classify that at about a 65%, and that's a 65% chance that we'll actually win the, the business. And then finally, the close at 100%. Now, um, it, it's um, good that uh, Howard it didn't use um, that S&M there because as we all know, S&M stands for sales and marketing. Uh, so um, a key component really of your overall game plan has to be the marketing and, and the metrics especially that you get from marketing because it, marketing helps to drive sales. So we, we rely upon a lot on email marketing uh, to generate interest, to generate awareness, to generate leads, and to build and enhance the brand. We also um, would like to do more of this, but we do some digital content marketing, and it's, it's I think, really important um, to be able to utilize that, especially if there's free components to the content that you're publishing, such as a blog um, or, or videos, um, as two examples. And then conferences are key for us um, to not only present um, our story to um, our audience, but also to generate leads. So uh, we attend the ACRL conference, um, MLA, uh, SLA from time to time, Special Libraries Association, Charleston, e, the ERNL conference, and then internationally, the UKSG conference, BALA, ALIA um, in Australia, and Frankfurt, of course. And regional meetings actually are really, really good for us because they're smaller meetings, um, so such as the Medical Library Association regional meetings can be quite beneficial to help uh, you engage with prospects and get to know them and turn them into customers. And finally, uh, social media. Um, how, really these days what, what we find with social media is that it helps to drive um, usage. Um, and it's, it's really a, an area for um, touching the user audience. Um, and although Increasingly, more and more librarians are on social media as well. Um, so now, the data, um, what you all came here to hear, really. Um, in sales, we, we look at a number of, of key data points. Um, and these are essential to knowing in terms of how we can work with a uh, library to, to get the sale. So uh, one of the key data points is denials. How many attempts are there, have there been over a certain period of time, usually a year or two, um, by users to access full, full text um, articles? Uh, usage reports, of course, are, are very important. 
Um, the impact factor, the ranking, the citation numbers, we're all familiar with these key metrics, and these are all very important. What we do um, with my organization is we create um, what we call a data sheet, um, and we put these numbers all in one place on a spreadsheet, and so we have it in a, in a concise, easy-to-use fashion that we will e email to our um, librarian contacts. Um, it's important, very important, especially if you're selling a collection, to know the holdings of um, the library, which um, we get from our publishers, but you can easily assemble it, um, and know going in not only what the library holds um, from your uh, collection, but also what it holds from other similar um, subjects, uh, similar journals and databases. We, um, it's essential to be able to use your authors, your editors, your reviewers, especially I find in international markets to be able to, to help um, demonstrate to libraries um, that uh, content from those companies or those countries is, is being published in your publication. So it's, it's really important to curate this data and be able to demonstrate to uh, librarians that their patrons are going to be reading not only content from around the world, but content by scholars in their countries and, and areas. So along with knowing the data, we need to know the customer. Um, it's essential to know the buying and budget cycle of, of libraries. It's important to know what they consider to uh, be need to have versus nice to have, and also in your own collection, um, what um, be able to address um, that uh, dynamic. And as I said before, what similar products do the libraries have? Uh, what do other libraries that are similar to the ones that you're um, talking to uh, subscribe to? So if, if Harvard's getting uh, a lot of the journals, but Yale isn't, um, and, and Dartmouth isn't, that's, that's interesting uh, information to know. Um, getting to know the key decision maker as a person. So again, this is data that you want to build up, but it's also a relationship because you're dealing with another human being. Um, and also providing exceptional customer service. And that's not just with uh, your customer service team, but it's with every member of your team that touches um, the product and the customers and the users. So I'd be remiss, finally, if we didn't talk about the tools to be able to um, store your data and manipulate um, and utilize your data. So um, we've all heard of Salesforce, uh, or most of us have. I use it. It's a great tool. There are other CRM uh, databases out there. This is an essential piece of our work these days. You can't do your job without it, really. Um, another um, fine um, vendor out there to utilize is Ringgold um, and their ability to um, produce gap reports and um, other key data that uh, you can utilize in your, um, in your uh, selling cycle, um, particularly about the institution that you're targeting. Um, Redlink, um, a, a great new vendor out there um, who supplies good usage information and um, uh, turnaway data. Um, and finally, um, resources that don't cost a lot of money, but uh, thing, items that are really, I think, important to have, which are Basically, I would sum it up by saying, by staying educated and informed. Um, there's a great book uh, I highly recommend called Buying and Selling Information by Michael Gruenberg. He is, it's about buying and selling information to libraries. Um, and the journal, of, uh, Handbook of Journal Publishing, which many of us may be familiar with. 
Um, smart selling on the phone, a little bit more general uh, book. Um, academic and professional publishing. Um, a blog, not the scholarly kitchen, but <laughs> uh, HubSpot. Um, and uh, it, HubSpot is, is a great um, a tool. So finally, um, there's a, another conference out there, which I'd also recommend, uh, one that I attended many times in my uh, early career. Um, it's now called the Specialized Information Publishers of America. And this conference has a, has a wealth of marketing and sales um, sessions. And something that I uh, would like to see SSP perhaps um, take a look at and, and incorporate a little bit more on the sales and marketing uh, area into uh, the agenda. So uh, hopefully we can see a little bit more of that um, going forward. So just to sum it up, um, we always want to be closing, so ABC, um, and to get to the 100% finish line. And um, sales is really um, the use of, of data in, to inform and act in the art of selling. So um, with that, I will turn it over to Kent, and we'll go to the next session. Great. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. So that's how you sell. <coughs> now, Amir is going to tell us about how you buy. Right? Right. Okay. Amira Aaron. Good morning. Um, so um, I'm going to be talking today. Let me see how this works. Yeah. Um, I'm going to be talking today about a variety of kinds of data that I use. Um, in my collections work, and that, and this you can generalize this um, to collections work in academic libraries. But before I start, um, it was interesting. I've been thinking a lot about data because of this presentation, and um, we had a, a publisher visit yesterday, which was um, very unusual, and um, especially in conjunction with this presentation, I thought a lot about it. So this is a, a smaller but respected publisher ca came, and um, instead of giving us really any information about their products, brought a packet of data with them. And it was a, a really an excellent packet of data. Um, it included information, thorough information about, you know, what Northeastern researchers had used, about turnaways, about editorial representation, about what authors had published in their journals, um, about chapter downloads, book downloads. Um, it was, an, and really in-depth subject usage information. It was, it was very interesting, because basically um, it, was, it was a room full of our selectors, um, because it covered sort of several subject areas. And, um, and I realized that they had just brought this packet and the whole, the whole little meeting was uh, looking at the packet and, and some of our selectors going, oh look, I didn't know so-and-so was an editor of that journal. And actually before the meeting started, we had been, um, our budget is very tight, so we had been thinking about what can we give up. And by the end of the meeting, I think we, not only were gonna retain our, um, purchases and subscriptions with this publisher, but actually probably expand them. So that was just an interesting um, uh, visit that, that really resonated in, in light of this presentation. But I want to talk today, because I know that, um, that you're not librarians. I don't know if there are any librarians in the audience, but um, I wanted to give you an idea of the kinds of data that we get now in libraries, because it's, it's exploded as data in all um, realms have exploded. But um, I wanted to show you about the kinds of data we get from our um, integrated library system, our library management platform, which is, we use the Ex Libra Alma um, backend system. Uh, talk a little bit about usage data, other heavily used data. And then I want to talk about um, 
additional factors, the more qualitative factors that I use in decision making that are perhaps not data driven. Um, I want to make a, just a note, all data in this presentation is fictional. It's not Northeastern data. It was the hardest part of doing this presentation was finding sample reports and not being able to show you really my actual reports, but <coughs> I did my best. <laughs> um, okay, so in doing the presentation, I realized, my God, I use data all the time. And it really, it's probably the majority of my job is looking at data. Um, what kind of data? Item counts, fiscal data, usage data, uh, demand-driven acquisitions data, ILL data, uh, turnaway reports, circulation data uh, for print, uh, productivity data for my staff, comparative data, how do we compare to other institutions, um, and then um, what we can gather from end user data, so behavioral data for our end users. Um, so let's start. Um, so um, a lot of these examples in the next few slides are taken from our library management platform, Alma. Um, and in this, um, for item counts, I can see exactly now for, um, and again, fictional data, but I can see, you know, for different subject areas, how many items we have um, by location. Um, so I get a really good picture of what we do have in the library. Um, and this, again, is, is um, mostly print, although we have a, some equivalent electronic reports, but this really concentrates on print. Um, Fiscal data and trends, so um, a tremendous amount of fiscal data that we can get out of the system now. Um, Alma has an analytics module um, based on an Oracle um, analytics um, system and uh, we can get out data that I could never get out before and I've been in this industry a long time. Um, and it's, it's just amazing what we can get now. So comparison of electronic and physical book and journal expenditures, just, you know, I can cut and slice the data in many, many ways. Um, I can get top five fund expenditures so I know exactly what we spent in all different kinds of formats, electronic serials, approvals, et cetera, et cetera. Um, fund status, I know from, um, Within the library, we've got several funds broken up by uh, basically subject area. And I know exactly what's encumbered, what's expended, and what our remaining allocations are in all of these areas. Um, never, never really had that in this format before. Um, do a lot of fiscal analysis of vendors. So, um, you know, transactions, what have we spent with each of our vendors? Um, how do they compare to each other? And there would be figures here, obviously. Um, and, and the percentage, again, it's not Northeastern data at all, so don't look at, at the percentages or anything. Um, transaction amounts. Other, all kinds of vendor reports, vendor, uh, vendor expenditure by individual library, top 10 vendors, this one is vendor expenditure and encumbrance of our top vendors. Um, so an amazing amount of data on vendors. Um, and vendor performance analysis. So I can get reports exactly on how many days of, you know, arrival of orders. So I, I know, you know, what the average time for one publisher is, one vendor versus another. Um, so, and I, we do look at these a lot. Um, and this all comes from our library management platform. And one of the neat things, and my staff really laughs at me a lot, but when I first saw the system, I think what convinced us to, to get this system, as an early adopter actually, was the, the dashboard concept. So when I log in in the morning into the system, I can see at a glance um, most of the data that I need to 
make sure things are on track. I can see what the top vendors are. I can see the top funds, see how much money I've left. Um, I can see you know, the number of items we've gotten in. Um, and and th there's various, I can put these together in various ways. So my acquisitions librarian has a different dashboard than I do. I'm, mine's more of a management oriented. But, um, you know, it's a, just, it's a tremendous amount of information at a glance. Things that I before had to ask for reports for and sometimes didn't get for a month or two. My favorite, I think, is the serials encumbrance report. Um, so I can see exactly what we've encumbered for serials, what's come in. So I, I have some judge of what's left to spend. Never, never really had that before effectively. This is a dashboard for somebody who might be in circulation. So um, loans and returns by patron group, number of loans, um, borrowing requests for ILL, lending requests for ILL. Just tremendous, again, right, up, right at your fingertips. Um, this might be a dashboard for an administrator, so I can even see cataloger activity. I can constantly know who's cataloging what and how much activity is going on. Uh, patron registrations by type, how many faculty have registered, how many students, what are their loans, loan statistics. Um, and uh, again, fund expenditures. So you can put these together in all different ways. And, and again, we've got this to look at. Um, so let's talk about usage data, because that, that directly affects you also. So um, with this system, if a publisher or vendor is using the Sushi um, standard, which I would highly advocate that you do, um, the sushi data goes directly into the system and I can look at it. I can look at it by a particular title. I can look at it by a platform. I can look at it, um, you know, constantly. Um, I can slice and dice it any, again, way I want to, but we do, it goes into the system. It's immediately visible and I can get any kind of reports out. Um, and then out of that, because the library management platform also has what we paid for things, I can get cost per use reports, which I never used to be able to really get. Um, we had to get a lot of those from our uh, big serial vendors, but now I can get it, um, again, I can get it from monographs, I can get it for, um, you know, by circulation count, I can get it cost per use for electronic resources. I should mention that Northeastern is, we're very much an electronic library. We really don't buy print anymore unless we have to. Um, but so really our concentration is on electronic resources. So cost per use reports, um, we use them very heavily in making decisions. I wanted to talk about some issues though with usage data. So again, we use, mainly standardized counter usage data. But um, with the current standard, there's still a little confusion about what to count. We, we never know exactly what the overlap is between HTML and PDF views, and so it, it's still a little confusing. Um, some libraries, uh, you know, if you're, if you're a non-counter um, publisher vendor, um, some libraries actually just assign a usage of zero um, to that, and that's, that's been documented in the literature too. We try to upload some manual reports if, if it makes sense, if they're close to counter, if we can. System does have that capability, but you know, less and, we, we wanna spend less and less time doing that. That's really not what we wanna be doing. Um, so I would really advocate you're using counter. Um, and the usage data also varies by type of resource as to what we count. So we really have to carefully evaluate it because it's different, you know, for a full text database, a A and I database, um, where we want to look at perhaps abstracts viewed, um, and uh, media. It's different, you know, n number of plays, 
Um, so so it, it's pretty complex, the way that we need to evaluate usage. Um, and then record views is also something that we struggle with a little because if a database is incorporated into the discovery system and that um, increases the record views, but does it really reflect real patron interest going after something? And we're hopeful that the new counter uh, release five standard will improve standardization and accuracy and, and take care of perhaps some of these um, ambiguities that we're faced with. At times, the data that we get from our link resolver, which for us is included in um, the ALMA system, but, but can be something like SFX in the past or some other link resolvers, at times that data for us can be a little more relevant, accurate, granular. Um, and I should mention one other thing about usage data. It needs to be granular. If, if I'm getting a package from you, having usage data for the package doesn't really help me because it, it doesn't, um, it, it may help me compare one package to the other, but it doesn't tell me if it's worthwhile to still be getting the package, which may be why you don't want to give me granular <laughs> usage data, but, but I would appreciate it. Um, so link resolver data, really um, tells us, um, gives us a really good picture of what users are doing. Um, the number of times they click through for a particular title, the number of times they click through to articles. Um, again, all made up data. Um, but you know, if I wanted to compare these two collections, um, tells me you know, really the, what the interest is and the number of times they click through. It also, um, Similar to turnaway reports, it tells me that the number of times um, they found an article, let's say in our discovery service, which we don't have access to, and the number of times they tried to get to that article. So, um, and there were no what's called full, t full text services for that particular um, item. So, for instance, in this made up example, there were over 10,000 searches in the area of technology that had no full text services available where people tried to get to content. So that gives, gives us a really good additional picture of what's going on. Um, okay, then there are overlap reports. So I can look at what we have, particular in, maybe in a particular area, what we have electronically, what we still have physically, and then I can look at the number of loans for um, the physical item and say, is it worth keeping this print book? Because you know the use is, is electronic now. So um, this, this isn't the greatest sample, but it's all I could find. Um, but, it, but again, very useful, these overlap reports. Um, the overlap reports also tell me um, I'm getting this title from three different collections, perhaps I don't need to be doing that. Um, so turnaway reports. Um, turnaway reports we definitely do use. They definitely constitute one of the factors in our purchase or lease decisions. Um, we use them most often, I would say, to sometimes increase the number of seats or to buy back files if we see that there's a lot of turnaways of earlier years of the publication. Um, but we need to carefully evaluate them because there's, they, they're different from publisher to publisher, vendor to vendor. Um, and sometimes there's errors, sometimes they're really prone to misinterpretation. Um, and, and so we really need to carefully look at them and, and often we discuss them with the vendor. Um, the case that I mentioned at the beginning yesterday those turnaway reports were really clear and they knew exactly what they represented. So that was very helpful to us. Um, sometimes the turnaway reports are misleading because we have alternate access. So we may be getting you know, an item from um, an aggregator that's used more than the actual publisher item. And so the turnaway report is nice, but we know that it's being used on this alternate access. Um, we're getting close to time. Um, 
we also need to, to analyze the cost per use when we use turnaway reports, and we need to look at it in conjunction with ILL use. Um, I'll quickly run through the rest. Most requested ILL journals use this all the time to um, influence purchases. Um, most requested um, interlibrary loan monographs, if, you know, these books have been requested a certain number of times, it's worth our buying them. Um, <coughs> Demand-driven acquisitions is extremely important for us for monographs. Our, our budget is mostly eaten up with serials, no surprise. So we have a heavy reliance on demand-driven acquisitions. And I just wanna stress that um, we have so little money for monographs that we can't afford to buy just in case. And that most monographs that we have in our demand-driven acquisitions um, program would never be made available to our patrons if it weren't for demand-driven acquisitions. So I know that the, some of the models have not been helpful to publishers and vendors. Um, and I should mention that I was a vendor twice before. I kept going back and forth. Um, so I do understand that. However, it's, it's really um, important for libraries to be able to have those plans. Um, we're now moving towards evidence-based plans um, I think it's better, it's probably better for you, it's better for us because we have a predictable budget and we don't, we know we're not gonna run out of money. Um, so the evidence-based plan is something that you should really consider. Um, again, usage data from our demand-driven acquisitions, we can tell exactly how many times it was used, when a purchase was triggered, et cetera. Um, Primo is our discovery system, and again, we can tell the top searches. We have a lot of information now that we're starting to um, harvest from our discovery system. Um, and comparative um, benchmarks, that's the next big um, horizon for um, library data. Um, we'll soon be able from our management system, because it's a cloud system, to compare ourselves in many ways to other libraries that use the same system. Um, okay, so just wanna wrap up with what's not data driven, which I think is important. So these are some of the factors used that I use that are not so data driven. Um, even if something is low use, is it the only similar resource in a discipline area, maybe a niche publication? Um, you know, I'm not gonna get rid of something because the cost per use is very high if that's the only thing that scholars in that area can use. Um, a publication that covers a new area of study may take several years to, you know, get up to the usage that I need. Um, new types of format or content where I was looking at, like the index of scholarly blogs, um, you know, has, has really been growing in interest. Um, faculty graduate student requests, and again, if faculty are authors or editors of, of publications. And of course, the price increase, is it reasonable? I just got a 250% price increase on a title last week, and I am not renewing it. it it's a collection, actually. That's an important co collection, and it's well used, but I'm not renewing it, um, unless the, the publisher comes way down. Um, so, so that's really important. I mean, our, we have limited budgets. We're, you know, and I'm not gonna cut out 20 other publications to be able to accommodate this unreasonable price increase. And um, also licensing, I'm, so a lot goes into the decision around, you know, the publisher relationship and the publisher behavior to, and vendor. You know, I use publishers and vendors sort of interchangeably here. Licensing issues, for instance, do they allow text data mining? Technical issues, do we have a lot of problem linking out to them through the link resolver? Do they provide IP access? If they don't provide IP access, we don't buy it. Um, it ease of access. Um, the relationship with the publisher is very important, um, especially at the end of the year, like now I have some money, I'm doing one-time purchases. If, you know, if a vendor has been really good to us with pricing, I'm much more, likely to um, consider that. Um, very important to us if the vendor does or does not follow industry standards and um, 
very important to us also, does the publisher vendor contribute content to all discovery systems equally? And do they participate in exclusive deals, which we hate? So there's a, a number of factors, and I'm sorry to take more than my time, but thank you very much. Your proximity alarm was going off. Huh? Your proximity alarm was going off. It was <laughs> creeping up on you. Uh, thank you very much. So now you've probably seen what the logic of the game plan here has been. So you hear, heard about how data is used in creating content, how data is used uh, in selling and buying, and now we get the business analyst who's going to put it all together and in one of the most beautiful <coughs> slideshows I've ever seen. Oh. So, Mary? Hi, everybody. So I'm Mary Seligi. I'm from Canadian Science Publishing, and I am a business analyst. And that means that I don't necessarily use a lot of data myself, but as a person who works with pretty much everybody in our organization, I work to help people do the things they want to do, mostly in technology, um, but slowly into business intelligence, which is using data. Yeah, I <laughs> forgot about that. <laughs> So I'm going to be talking to you about the Canadian Science Publishing, Publishing Journal Health Metrics Initiative. And we gather data all the time, as you do on sales, uh, ops, uh, every area of business, but not necessarily for you know, particular uh, um, purposes. We all accumulate lots of data. So I would say that this initiative is really our first foray into a a really formalized approach to a cross-functional initiative which involves uh, lots of areas of the business. Just to give you a little bit of uh, context here, because here this is important, um, Canadian Science Publishing actually started off as the publishing arm of the National Research Council of Canada, which is part of the federal government of Canada. And um, we left the government about seven years ago and privatized to become a fully a private not-for-profit corporation. Uh, when we were part of the federal government, we didn't really look at data or care about data all that much. We didn't really, because we didn't really need to. We, we were well-funded, we had, but more importantly, we weren't necessarily the ones driving the business direction or making business decisions. So this is a, a huge change for us, and now that we've successfully made the transition from public to private life as a corporation, this is a, a very big reality for us, and we want to ensure that our decisions are rooted in well-founded data. I went to a workshop not that long ago on business intelligence for business analysts, and I heard a statistic that Fully 40% of key business decisions made by business leaders today are actually gut and intuitively driven. And to me, that sounds terrifying. And I'm sure that works out a lot of the time because as a few of the other speakers have noted, you know, it is kind of a careful mix between the, the intuitive and the, and the database. But um, we ourselves really want to ensure that our tactical and strategic decisions are rooted in data because when you've been publishing journals for a long time, and I did forget to mention that we've been publishing since 1929, so we've actually been around for quite a while. When you've had journals for a long time, you kind of sort of start to think that you know everything about them without having to really think about it too much, kind of like uh, maybe your kids. So, um, so we wanted to start this initiative to answer a key business question, which is how healthy are our journals really? Now that we've sort of landed into our not-for-profit status, we are successfully, we've got our sea legs under us, let's look at our most valuable assets and really, you know, figure out a way to determine, to assess them um, uh, appro with appropriate measures, how healthy, how well are they doing, um, and where, what, what do we need to fix or else learn from. So, this initiative was designed to answer this single question, and it's a simple and intuitive question, easy to ask, so how hard could it be to answer, right? Well, <laughs> turns out it's really challenging. We have a little internal working group inside our organization uh, which came together to try and figure this out. So I'm, it's a young initiative, so I'm not gonna be telling you too much about what we found so much as our process, because we hope to use this as a framework for other initiatives and uh, my hope here today is that this will be of use to you in terms of thinking about how you might figure out your own processes around this. 
So our initiative go goals with the initiative were to um, really determine what the key measures are for assessing how healthy a journal is. Like, what are the key things that you need to know about your journal that tell you, okay, this journal is healthy, it's doing all right. Um, and then, you know, measure all of the, the journals, and I should say that we have 23 journals, three of which are open access. So looking at all of those journals, figuring out the numbers for each of these measures, establishing some baselines so that we have some trends going forward, but most importantly, you know, actioning what we found out, figuring out where the strengths and weaknesses are, maybe some hidden opportunities, and really doing something about it. Um, so when we first started this initiative, we just dove right in, because we didn't <laughs> really know how to approach this. So we gathered and we brainstormed about everything that we could think of around <coughs> what might indicate journal health. And we came up with a whole pile of things. And this is just a partial list, it's kind of crazy. But eventually, we realized that the, the really sort of methodical way of doing this is be to start, of course, with the business requirements for a journal, like the basic business needs. So for us, you know, and we will probably, we will add more of these to the journal's health scorecard later on, but just to start, because it's important to start these initiatives sort of small and then do iterations to gradually grow it. So our starting processes are, um, a journal has to have quality submissions, obviously. It has to have costs that are reasonable and at least maintained, if not lowered year over year. It has to have solid revenue. And it has to have a good, uh, broad inter, uh, usage. For us, this, this part is really important. Our journals are Canadian journals. Uh, we're very proud of them and we want them, they've always had or intended to have international reach, but we want to make sure that's actually true. That that the usage isn't mostly just you know in our little corner of the universe. We want to know that they are being broadly and deeply used in all of the places around the world that we want them to be. So, first key challenge is figuring out what measures are we going to use to assess the health of our journals. Out of so many of the things we could be looking at, we need measures which are you know, are going to be accurate and efficient for telling us right away, okay, here's a problem, here's a strength, something like that. So the key thing that we found is ask the subject matter experts in your organization. So if you're looking at financial data, you know, go to your finance people, go to your accountants or your director of finance or whoever, or who are the, 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 number, the bean counters, and ask them, you know, what measures really make sense? What says to you when you look at a journal balance sheet, oh, problem, or no, this is actually doing all right. Same thing with uh, ops. So if you're looking at areas of a journal health which have to do with, say, submissions or some other area of operations, go to your ops people, go to your editorial people, go to your, you know, your operations, your managing editors, whoever knows. Because at the end of the day, these measures are not going to be useful to you as, as uh, indicators of journal health unless they are practical. Um, so just to give you an example, uh, submissions is something that's really obviously important to us for assessing journal health. And there were a lot of ideas thrown out at the beginning. Oh, let's look at total numbers of submission per year. Let's look at the acceptance rate. Let's look at the rejection rate, all of that. Uh, but at the end of the day, when we sat down and talked, you know, interviewed the director of operations and talked with a couple of the managing editors, we came up with something that we dubbed the Submission Health Index. And this is, it's pretty, pretty basic, but it's, uh, it's effective. So it's, it's, it's just a ratio of the number of accepted manuscripts per year divided by the number of accepted manuscripts that a journal actually needs to achieve full, tech, full uh, page allotment for that year. And that, that, um, that number of, of needed accepted manuscripts obviously differs by journal, but the ratio of that is what we'll be comparing across the journals. And this, to us, makes the most sense because the fact that it's accepted manuscripts gives the implication of the, the, the fact that it goes to the quality of the submission and you have your need looked after. Other critical measures that we took into account for some of the other business processes that we're looking at in our journal health report card so cost health index, we decided to go with production plus production cost plus direct overhead. And the reason why we went with direct, so this is, by direct overhead I mean 
the cost that a journal incurs just to stay alive, just to do what it's supposed to do. So that doesn't include overhead for things like promotion, you know, marketing, all that stuff. And this is a key distinction, that w a key choice that we made because uh, when we talked with our financial people, um, the feeling was that, or the thinking is that, um, you know, if you find that a journal is flagging, for example, that's when you decide to throw a little, what our accountant calls money love at it, <laughs> you know, to try and support it and help it to, uh, to prosper. But you can't really effectively decide how much to give or how much, you know, what, to, what decision to make in that, how much, res how much resources to throw at it, if you've already kind of factored that into your cost. So we just do a direct overhead for that. I think one of the things we're struggling the most with figuring out how we want to measure is, is usage. And we're looking at full text uh, HTML and PDF downloads. But for us, getting back to um, that sense of international reach, uh, we, we looked at usage around the world by country and of our content. And we found some interesting things. We found that usage depends on who's doing the looking. So we found that some journals were really the front runners in usage in, say, Japan, and we had stragglers there. But then you might go to the UK and look at usage there, and the trend could be completely reversed, or at least sub substantially different. So then, then you have to think about maybe looking at what markets matter to you and look at it within the context of that. So it's actually, a little, usage is, is, a, is a sort of a tricky thing. So uh, one other thing we learned along the way that is that it's really important to normalize data where it makes sense to do so. So in this initiative, recall that we are um, comparing journals to one another, our journals, and to make a good apples to apples comparison, you need to normalize some of your measures. So for example, with costs and revenue, we normalize those per page because some of our journals have huge page allotments and others not so much. So it's not fair to compare them you know, with the absolute costs and, and uh, revenue, you really need to, you know, if you want to be accurate about it, you've got to normalize it. Similarly, with usage, um, it, I feel like we're going to go towards um, uh, usage by article, actually, to sort of normalize that, because some of our journals, again, have huge outputs of articles and others not so much. So, once we've assigned, uh, you know, or, or, or developed our measures and we've measured our journals in these areas of measurement, how much health does that actually mean? So giving the example again of the submissions health index, which I'll just remind you again, for us means the number of accepted manuscripts you actually get for a journal divided by the number it actually needs to achieve full page uh, allotment for that year. Um, you might have a whole range of values that are around 1.0, around 1.0 being like a perfect score. If you have way less than 1.0, obviously you gotta start beating the bushes, you need more submissions. But if it's way too above one, that's not great either because then you start to incur costs. So you really need to sort of optimize that. And the tricky part here, well first of all, we wanna grade these measures. We don't wanna just measure them, we wanna be able to assign you know, is this, a, is, this a, is this an A journal health-wise, is it B or is it C? So obviously something that's really below one is gonna be a C, and too high will be possibly a C too. But, uh, but really the trick here is developing, you know, understanding what the tolerances are. How far can a journal move away plus or minus 1.0 and still be considered healthy? And it may depend on the journal, how, how what its tolerance limit is. So we're not just gonna arbitrarily say, oh, okay, so the tolerance is 1.0 plus or minus 5%. If we do that, that 5% better be rooted in something that's based on a logical rule. So we're tr still trying to work out what that means. So does that mean that, so, we, so all of our journals, I'm sure yours as well, have um, an average page number that you've assigned per article. So it may come down to something like that where we estimate plus or minus so many pages. This is, again, something we're still working out. Um, at the end of the day, though, we want to end up with something like this for each of the journals, so a sort of report card, where you not only have the numbers that uh, a person who has to make a decision can see, but also a very quick and visual way of understanding what is going on with that journal. And then, when, and then also, when you've, you've measured all of the journals and can begin comparing, you see, you know, um, some pictures. So this is this is actual data from all of our journals. I've anonymized them, uh, and this is actually normalized by article. 
And you can see that one journal is particularly, you know, far and away above the others. This is total usage, by the way, total HTML and PDF downloads. Um, and you have some that are, look pretty strong other than, you know, if you factor that one biggie out, you have some that are fairly strong and others that are kind of weak. And so the next logical step in this initiative will be to take a deep dive in some of these areas where you see obvious areas of strength and obvious areas of weakness and try to figure out what's really going on there so you can fix the problem or else learn from you know, what, what makes one journal so strong. So to do that, uh, we do what in business intelligence they call uh, process mapping, which is where you start to take a really close look at the picture around the, the business process. So let's say I have a journal that has a very small, a very low, unhealthy submission um, index, su submission health index. So then when we build this framework up where we kind of I have identified all of the factors, measurable factors, that's key, that play into that key measure of, key business process measure of submissions, then we can start to, using data, really pinpoint the root cause of the problem because we'll also be discovering relationships among these different things that factor into submissions. And one of the things that this could eventually turn into, form the basis of is tables for a database because most business intelligence in, uh, solutions uh, basically work the, their way into a database which underlies many of the visualization tools that uh, my colleagues have, sh have shown you so far. So, some uh, ne directions for our next iteration. You know, you can see that we have a lot of work to do with refining uh, s some of the scoring rubrics that we're using and the tolerance limits because the tolerance limits will be different depending on what measure we're talking about. You know, in submissions, you want to be close to a particular number. But if you're talking about revenue, obviously, the more the better. So that's, you know, <laughs> so, that's, so it's going to be a little bit different. Um, will most likely add uh, more business goals and processes to look at. Um, and also, we're probably going to look at our OA, OA journals in a different light. I'm not saying that they don't have the same proce business processes. They certainly do. OA journals have cost and revenue and usage to worry about just like any other journal. But it's a different model. So you, you're, you're probably going to uh, need different tolerance levels and uh, consider them a little bit differently. So, so what kind of decisions will we end up making as a result of this? Uh, well, if you've got a journal that is strong in some things but has a huge cost, then you obviously need to figure out why. And that might end up affecting things like process and workflow. You know, if you have a journal that has great submissions and everybody loves using it around the world, um, the costs are fine, but you know, you've got some not enough revenue. So then you might consider, that's where you start looking at, you know, what can we do to throw some money love at this and promote it a little bit more, maybe change the distribution channels a little bit. Um, and another interesting thing that we anticipate using this for, so in the last uh, year or so, we've actually acquired three new journals and we're in the process of acquiring a fourth new one. And this is a rubric that we, or a, a framework that we hope might help us to assess new journals as they come in as we're considering them. Um, so just to conclude this, and I guess my presentation is a lot shorter than everybody else's, but I guess that's a small mercy too because it's close to lunch. Um, the, the data is really just about numbers. Uh, people don't act on numbers. They act on the story that's in the numbers. So when you are working in your own shop to develop something like this, it's really important to bring together the people who, who each work in the individual areas where your data is coming from to, under, to help you make good data that's well-founded, that makes sense, that is practical for that given area. You need those people to work together and uh, you need to continually work and check your process. And then finally, make it visual in a way that the people who have to make decisions, in our case, that's our executive director and our board of directors, in a way that makes, you know, instantly pops out at them, oh yes, we need to work on this and this, but they also have the numbers to sort of, you know, take that deeper dive. And the last thing I'm gonna do is say thank you. Oh, sorry, wrong way. Silly technology. What have I done here? Yes, there we go. I say thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you.
So I'm going to move up one slide. We're a little pressed for time, but all you're missing is a lousy Caesar salad. So if you want to stay and ask questions, there are microphones here. If we have questions from uh, the remote uh, site, that's fine. But I have a couple I wanted to ask just to get things going. So, and this is the perfect slide to ask one of the things I wanted to, to mention is a lot of the, the conversation was about the power of narrative and how you have to take data and put it together. So can, and in speaking into the microphones because we do have remote, um, can you talk a little bit about your experience with that? I mean, we talked about curation, we talked about how important people are in this process. Ultimately, they're the decision makers, so the, the data can't just be um, exist on their own, they have to have some sort of story. So can you talk a little bit about how you bridge that data into a story? Oh, that's me? It can be. <laughs> uh, well, as I said, we're just, we are just beginning with this. We're, we're, you know, just starting out down this path of really using data in a way to, but I think our report card uh, is, is one way of telling a story. I mean, that certainly, that's a, a sort of metaphor that everyone can relate to, and I think um, having, um, you know, uh, having the journals sort of lined up with the report cards in front of them is something that uh, is something that does tell a story about where the strengths and weaknesses really are, and um, uh, I think I think keeping getting things as visual as possible, but ensuring those visualizations are rooted in the actual data and not just sort of arbitrarily assigned, which believe me is tempting to do, is is a really important part of telling the story. So one other thing, another theme, and I'll see if you guys jump a little bit more at this one, is the there there's a still a mix that everybody has to deal with between physical space and e-resources, right? So you have things existing in the physical world. Howard, you were talking about how if you have something published online first and then you back it up with the print, it, it performs better, how your print distribution is still so large. You have all your resources at Northeastern, you know, with ILL and other things. You have to, international is, you know, from a distribution standpoint is seamless, but, but from a sales standpoint is not. So. How, would, how do you reconcile data into the physical world and the physical world into data? Well, Minor question. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if this exactly addresses your point, Kent, but I mean, what in terms of, say, print versus electronic, ironically, the, the, um, some of the international areas that we deal in still want the print. And so, um, gathering that data from the libraries and, and having an appropriate price to cover the cost of shipping um, is, is an important piece of data for us to have. Um, and because um, a lot of the, you know, I, I guess the certain areas are, have spotty internet coverage or, or are, their patrons aren't used to quite using it all on, online yet. Uh, Howard, when you talk, when you, how do you draw lines between your online usage and your print distribution? Right, so um, our publishers, Tom Easley, and I, I would say when uh, Tom arrived a few years after I did, uh, we still had substantial print circulation. For example, JAMA Internal Medicine had a print circulation of about 60,000. I think as of this morning, it has a print circulation of 20,000. But at the same time, it's gone from 2 million views to 10 million views. So over the period of five or six years, we've made this transition from um, um, from print to digital. It's interesting because the editor-in-chief, uh, Rita Redberg, said, oh, she just stopped printing it, and Tom refused to stop printing it. it. Makes no money for us in the print. But Tom felt until uh, we had a stronger uh, electronic fingerprint, stop printing it was an, uh, would have been a mistake. Um, only three or four of our journals actually make money in print, but there's still some reasons to have print. But we're clearly transitioning from a print-dominated uh, publication group in 2010 to a digital publication group in 2017 or 18. But Tom really makes decisions journal to journal, uh, not uh, a uniform decision for all 12. Great. Yep. Follow okay. on for uh, Howard, um, Jane from Health Affairs. Mm -hmm. So your decision to uh, stop book reviews, uh, this ties to the print versus online. Did you make that with only online data? 
uh, decision, or did you evaluate how people read book reviews? Yeah, print? it's really been hard. Uh, if you, I mean, Jane, you know the the data re re returns on surveys is now under ten percent. So it's so hard to evaluate the the information that you're getting when people return questionnaires. You know, uh, Tom gets readership surveys for the, from the ads. It's not what I generally pay attention to. So that really has has been a struggle because it's very hard now to get information about the print. And since we're more digitally focused, I would say the majority of the decision is now driven by our, uh, uh, on something that we really have quantitative, high quality quantitative data. And when I make decisions that people don't like, I hear from them. My email address is readily available and people have no problem telling me all the mistakes I make on a daily basis. <laughs> Lucky man. Any other questions? Yep. Yeah. We have some from remote. Hi, yeah, we have a, a question from Pippa Smart online. Um, it's for Howard as well. Uh, she asked, the development of shorter content is a great way to react to reader needs, but at what point does a journal become more of a blog or a magazine and less of a journal? And uh, does the data show that this is actually what the JAMA readers are asking for? Yeah, it, that's a, uh, it's a, it's not a question I think I, I can answer. We distinguish the different types of content that we have. So we actually have a policy blog, and it's written by eight or 10 really senior health policy people. But if you look at the quality or the type of content in that blog, the use of personal pronouns, narrative, um, data in a different way is very, very different than if it was an original investigation or a viewpoint. So we've really been very, very careful to distinguish blog-like material from what we believe is meant to be um, more evidence-based um, clinical material. A and I think that's held us in good stead. J JAMA has an, an important reputation and integrity to maintain. So we really tried to help the reader distinguish b between kind of the informal blog-like material versus uh, more evidence-based driven material. I, I would just say one other thing. We haven't been able to do everything we wanted. Sometimes we were just slow. You just run out of intellectual and financial resources. And I just want to let you know, from our standpoint, that's actually worked pretty well for us sometimes, even though it wasn't, I wasn't so excited about it. So I'll, I'll give you an example. We, we just didn't have the bandwidth to launch an author center. Uh, you know, Authors love to know how, how much everyone loves them. We, and we just didn't have time to, or, or the resources to launch an author center. But technology made it easier for us. We were slow for a year or 18 months. Now we have author love notes. They get a love note from me at JAMA or from Rita at JAMA IM at two days, three months, six months, and a year. It tells them views, citations, alt metric score, and it gives them a toll-free link to the article. They're in love with it, okay? So we were slow at developing an author center, but then technology solved the problem for us in a way that authors like much more than if we had an author center, because we push it to the authors. They don't have to go anywhere to get it. So if, if you're slow at doing things, don't worry. Technology may solve that problem for you. Perfect. Yeah. yeah just a quick question for both the buying end and the selling end. Uh, I mean, right now, we're still predominantly subscription, but, but the OA is getting momentum over and over. So the question for the selling, like the, the marketing strategy in how that would be different I mean, for, for the open access journals. And for the buyer, the library, how do you select open access journals um, as more and more titles become available? Well, I, one, so there's two things. One is with, with OA journals, we really want to drive the usage and, and work with the marketing team to, to get the, the journal read. Um, and in addition, we also include um, in collections that we sell both OA journals and, and subscription journals. So it's it's a mix. And so we you know we we look to have each supplement the other. So money coming from different ends now. Okay, so just one quick comment on that. It's really hard for libraries to manage that mix. So we'd much rather have OA journals separately. Um, but anyway, how do we select? Yeah, how do we select OA journals? Um, 
we, we select them basically the same way that we select um, journals that we're paying for. Um, and um, we have our selectors, our subject selectors, actually look at the journal and evaluate the quality and the brand and et cetera. Um, we don't just provide access to all OA journals. Um, and, you know, there are, there's the directory of open access journals we do provide access to. Um, Great. Um, yep. Yeah, first of all, I've really enjoyed all of the presentations. They were, they were fabulous. Great. Um, question for Mary and for Howard. Um, I'm editor-in-chief of CDC's journal, Preventing Chronic Disease, so a lot of what you talked about really resonated with me. My question is, what systems are you using to actually capture this data that you were sharing with us all? Yeah, what, what is that system? And a second part to that question is, um, uh, over time, the adaptability of that system to, to be tailored to get you the data you need to do the kind of reporting out that you shared today. So we're just starting out. So we have uh, data from, we're really doing things old school. We're just pulling data from all of the different, you know, usual sources where you could get it. So for example, mm -hmm. usage data, actually usage data comes from our delivery platform, uh, but also, you know, it's possible to get that data from uh, classic web analytics like uh, Google Analytics. Maybe not, maybe not the downloads, but some of the other usage statistics we're looking at. Uh, submission data comes from our submission system. Um, financial data, uh, I think we're using, I want to say Great Plains accounting software, so it basically comes right out of that. So that's not, I mean, in an ideal uh, solution you would, ha well, there's actually a lot of debate in the business intelligence community about whether it's better to have a centralized system to house and to warehouse your data. You know, there's obviously advantages to having it all centralized, but there's also an argument to be made to having it, it maintained in its separate, you know, usual house. Um, but right now, this is what we have to work with, and we're pulling it together in Excel, which is also not ideal, because Excel is not a great data manipulation tool. But we're, what we're hoping to do is to build on what we're developing in the thinking and organizing of the data to, to possibly moving to more sophisticated solution going forward. So each one of our vendors provides us different data, silver chair, um, uh, EJP, and then uh, we put it into a digital dashboard and then it's re-manipulated within the digital dashboard so that each of us can get out of it from uh, what we want. In general, I don't see financial data, and it's very good that I don't actually see financial data. I'm the editor, and there's a publisher who looks at the financial data, and, and so there is some separation of church and, and state. On the other hand, I would say an editor who pays no attention to the finances of their journal will have a short-lived tenure. Hi, I'm Tommy Doyle from Elsevier. Um, great to see so much data being used. I'm a big fan of it and use it all the time. Um, so what we saw today was very much what in other industries people describe as very early stage data. So it's, and data use, it's very uh, retrospective and reporting focused. Mm -hmm. um, all over Boston, I attend loads of technology company events uh, where they're blending data and they're getting into predictive modeling and starting to layer on different AI applications. Mm -hmm. It's becoming a lot cheaper, a lot more accessible, and a lot more easy to do. You don't have to be an expert or a data scientist. I just wanted to poll the audience to see, have they seen much uh, application of predictive modeling AI technology? And if not, would they like to? Audience? <laughs> How many of you have started to talk about making those kinds of projections, machine learning, artificial intelligence, things like that. So a small, small smattering. Any idea why not? Bandwidth, Bandwidth resources. What? So they're gonna make it cheap and easy. Yeah, so make it cheap and easy, you'll get adoption, right. Okay, well in the interest of time, I'm gonna close it up. Any more questions from remote gentlemen back there? No, we're good? Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, speakers. Enjoy your lunch. Thanks. Thank you.